Imagine you had an idea for a kids TV show that would follow a bunch of cute woodland animals working together as they travel across the land in order to find themselves a new place to live. And then imagine that you would go all George R. R. Martin and have many of these cute woodland animals killed off one by one and that every single character you grew to like and enjoy will more than likely be taken away from you. And not just in a peaceful off-screen scenario, but with blood, violence and under tragic circumstances. It's my fault! I'm his mother! I'm supposed to protect him! Oh, you're a good mother. You did your best. So did you. Ladies and gentlemen, I give to you the Animals of Farthing Wood. But before we get into some of the more controversial stuff, let's first get back to some basic information on what this show is about. And by the way, I'm going to try and keep this first part of the review as spoiler free as possible. When I start to discuss certain scenes that could potentially ruin the plot for new viewers, I'll give a spoiler warning and give you time to then skip ahead in that part of the video. It's also important to note that even though there are a total of three seasons to this show, for this review I'll be focusing on Season 1 and we'll focus on Seasons 2 and 3 in a later entry. So what's the plot? Well the show actually does a pretty good job of summing this up itself in the Episode 2 by offering a recap of what happened in Episode 1. So for this one I'm just going to let the show do the talking. Farthing Wood was our home, but when human machines came to destroy it, our lives were in great danger. They even filled in our pond, leaving us with no water to drink. We all met in a great assembly to plan our escape. But I know a place that we could go to. Toad would guide us to a place he knew called White Deer Park, where humans had made a nature reserve for all wild creatures. We voted that Fox should be our leader, and then we all swore a solemn oath to protect each other. We meet by the Great Beach at midnight. And that's the premise. Over the course of the episodes, we then follow the animals along the journey as they encounter new scenarios and various obstacles, where they will meet new friends and lose old ones. Let's talk about the characters. The show does a really good job of having a large cast of characters, yet still managing to give them their own distinct personalities and traits. Even if you were only able to listen to the audio, you would very quickly be able to pick up on which of the animals is talking. This is because they not only have certain catchphrases, such as Weasel's laugh or the rabbit's constantly saying Don't panic! Don't panic! But they also have a huge vocal range, some with very strong accents, others matching up to their specific animal species. For example, Adder the snake has a strong lisp to emphasise the S to give a hiss sound, or how Owl puts greater emphasis on O sounds to give it more of a hoot sound effect. Certain characters get fleshed out more than others, and some begin to form strong friendships over the course of the episodes. One that was particularly interesting was the bonding between Owl and Adder, who on surface level seem like two very different pieces of chemistry, but they begin to bond over hunting for mice and soon find that they have a lot in common, particularly with the questioning of Fox's leadership and this will come into play multiple times throughout the series. As well as the major characters, there are also some minor characters that appear throughout the episodes. One of which that particularly stands out is this weird horse, who I think has one of the greatest laughs ever. <laughs> it's the fact that it just comes out of completely nowhere and catches you off guard. I think Fox's face perfectly sums up mine when I first heard it. <laughs> there are some characters, however, that aren't quite as likeable. The one that springs to my mind, which will probably cause a lot of divided opinion, is Mole. In almost every scene, he just seems to be whinging or crying about something. What are you crying for now? You stupid, undersized seal. Which I guess is meant to be played up for the cute factor, but in all honesty, it just irritates me more than anything. Molly, 
if only your tears weren't salty, none of us would ever be thirsty again. And then probably my second dislike character is Vol. Again, kind of like Mole, he's always so negative, always whinging and complaining. Mostly about how the small creatures aren't getting the same respect as the larger ones, which is fair enough. But then when a certain incident happens, that we'll talk about later, when the smaller animals opt to stay behind, Vol apologises to Badger saying that he was wrong and wishes for the group to get back together. All seems fine, until only in the next episode, he starts whinging and complaining yet again as if he learnt nothing. Okay, now let's look at the art style and animation. I really like the art style to this show. Like Watership Down, the animals are hand drawn with a realistic style and tend to move as animals would. This realistic style blends nicely with the watercolour backgrounds, which I must say are beautifully drawn and really set the atmosphere for the show. Seriously, every now and then, just take the time to pause the show and appreciate some of the artwork going on in the background. As for the animation, well, it's okay. For the most part, it's passable. The animals are animated to move in a realistic way to suit their art style, which is good. But quite often, you'll find some flaws, such as mouth movement not properly syncing up to what the characters are saying, sometimes the mouths aren't moving at all when the characters are talking, Characters will occasionally go off model, and the scaling seems to be a bit sporadic at times. And when you start paying attention, you'll notice quite a lot of the animations are reused multiple times throughout the series. But I imagine the show was working on a relatively low budget for a television series, so I won't blame it too hard for the corners that had to be cut. Animation is after all an expensive and time consuming process. I should know. I've tried and failed to do it in the past myself. The music. The music is a simple orchestra that fits well with the art style. For its core, there are only about a few tracks that play throughout the first series, but those few tracks work well and help set the tone for each scene, be it light-hearted, dramatic, or saddening. And despite only using a few core tracks, they do implement some variety as to what instruments are being used to make it feel a bit more unique quite often using specialised instruments for when different animals are on screen. Take a look at this clip for example. Okay, let's take a look at the violence. So now we're going to be dipping into some spoiler territory as I begin to talk in depth about certain scenes in the season. So if you don't want to have certain plot points spoiled, skip to this point in the video and join me then. So part of the reason this series is so well known is for the numerous character deaths that happen throughout, and I don't mean that lightly. This show was honestly Game of Thrones before Game of Thrones was a thing. After you've finished watching all three seasons, just go back to watch episode 1 of season 1 and see how many characters you can point out that aren't alive by the end of season 3. Seriously, do it. Some of these deaths, like the Newts, are relatively tame. They presumably die off screen but it's never 100% confirmed or shown. Others, like the Hedgehogs, are more emotional. As the couple are crossing the motorway, one of the hedgehogs freezes in shock and can't go on, his partner realises that he will most likely die, and so she voluntarily goes back to die with him. They both die on screen, in a tragic but also kinda heartwarming way. Then you get a death scene like this. Bird. Yeah, that's what they call me. Holy fucking shit. Talk about going all out brutal. Not only deciding to kill off a bunch of newborn babies, but to have their bodies skewered onto a thorn bush while their blood trickles down the branches. And again, I emphasize, this is a U rating. In fact, the entire series was given a U rating all except for the VHS for the end of season 2. So fuck knows what's going to happen in that episode. This is again similar to the controversial age rating given to Watership Down. 
which if you're unaware is also an animated film starring animals with questionable violence. But Animals of Fire and Wood came out 20 years later than Watership Down. So there's not really the excuse of, well, it came out in the 70s, it was a different standard. This is actually relatively modern. Do censors just automatically presume a cartoon about cute woodland critters could not possibly have anything wrong with it? And so just slap on a U rating by default? I'm honestly surprised that this episode of South Park didn't also get a U rating. But for me personally, the death scene that I found to be the most impactful throughout this season was... The deaths of Mr. and Mrs. Pheasant. I remember watching Animals of Farthing Wood on TV as I was growing up, and from that I have vague memory of deaths in the show. The hedgehogs and even the baby mice. But I honestly had no memory of the pheasant's deaths. And maybe that was for the best. Maybe I had made a conscious effort to mentally block it into the shadowy part of my mind. As watching this again, their deaths are really something else. We'll start off with Mrs. Pheasant. Her character in this show is so unfortunate. Of all the animals, she is one of the kindest, yet also seems to be the one that gets treated like shit. Mostly from her husband. Stupid bird! Take it out at once! I was only doing my best. In fact, the whole reason she ends up dying is because she doesn't want to wake up her husband, so takes up watch duty by herself. Once her husband hears of her death, he is overwhelmed with guilt and sorrow, and in her honour, decides to voluntarily go back to the farm in order to save Ada, who got left behind. It's what follows next that really gets messed up. Ada! Not only has Pheasant just had his wife murdered, but then he sees her cooked body served up on a plate. And what makes this scene really eerie is the way that the feet are still attached to the body. Who eats poultry with the feet still attached? And it's from his sheer crying and distress that leads him to being shot by the same farmer who killed his wife, to the point where he couldn't even see the farmer because his eyes were so full up with his tears. It is absolutely depressing. But on the same note, as horrible as this scene is, I actually think it's one of my favourite scenes in the entire show. The music that accompanies this scene is absolutely perfect, building and building as the tragedy and the intensity rises and the drums that play as the farmer raises his rifle, chilling perfection. And as tragic and sometimes disturbing that these scenes may be, it is really these death scenes that gives the show its driving force. Knowing that any one of the characters faces the prospect of death at every corner in the most brutal and heartbreaking way not only keeps the stakes raised throughout the show, but also makes you want to cheer on the characters more to have them finally reach their place of paradise to find happiness. Even on the back of the DVD, it notes that the series pulled no punches in depicting the animal's struggle for survival. Yeah, that's an accurate statement. And aside from characters' brutal deaths, there are also a couple of other scenes which I find a bit questionable for the U rating given. This dog, for example. You got me tidy knots, you clever dick. Did he just call Fox a... Clever dick, clever dick, clever dick. Yeah, I I'm sure this isn't being used in the context of actually calling someone a penis. 
but I've never heard an expression where you call someone a clever dick. Has anyone else? Also, there's this scene with Weasel and Badger where Weasel gets a bit drunk on wine and makes this interesting remark. I'm nice too, Badger, when you get to know me. <laughs> Which you will, now that we're holed up together. <laughs> Anyway, moving away from that stuff, one interesting thing to note is that none of the animals in this show, at least in season 1, are portrayed as straight up villains, but rather as just animals who are doing their bit to survive. The bird that caused the incident in the previous episode is actually seen having a casual conversation with Fox in the next. And when Fox calls out the bird on doing such a nasty thing, the bird seems shocked and states that foxes do the same thing all the time even assuming that the only reason Fox is after the other animals is to hunt and eat them. Even the heroes we follow on their adventures are frequently seen killing and eating other animals for food, because you know, that's what happens in nature. Predators must eat or else they will starve to death. And although this may seem like an obvious thing to say, so many shows gloss over this and just make the predators out to be cold-blooded killers that do it for the sport. There's another scene where Toad gets captured by a carp in a lake, and when he eventually gets rescued and the carp is left there suffocating by the lake edge, Toad actually feels bad for the fish, knowing that it was only doing what it needed to do to survive, and asks that it be put back in the lake to live on the rest of its life. But even though the animals aren't painted up as villains, there are lots of jabs at humans in this series, and the show clearly has an underlying tone of how humans are impacting the wildlife. Human development, humans starting a fire from littering a cigarette, highway traffic killing animals, quarrying destroying the land, the use of pesticides, and of course, hunting. And maybe this is just me, but I also got hints of an underlying tone highlighting a class system amongst the animals, similar to how Zootopia did it with carnivores being second class citizens to the herbivores, I get that same vibe in Farthing Wood with much smaller animals being second class citizens to the larger ones, but maybe that's just me looking into it a bit too much. Overall, Season 1 of The Animals of Farthing Wood is something I'd recommend. It has a simple but decent story with strong characters and character development. The element of death keeps the tension high and delivers some surprisingly emotional scenes. And though this season has a U rating, there are definitely a lot of mature themes here that I think older audiences can pick up on and enjoy. There are three ways of acting wisely. The first is through meditation. This is the noblest. Second, by imitation. This is the easiest. Third, by experience. This is the bitterest. And that's The Animals of Farthing Wood Season 1. Leave a like if you enjoyed the video and comment on what you thought when you were watching the series. Also let me know if there's any other films or TV shows that you'd like me to review in a future entry. Join us next time where we'll be taking a look at Season 2 of The Animals of Farthing Wood, which follows their adventures in White Deer Park. Does this mean that their troubles are over now and they finally found sanctuary? No.